Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss best practices in metadata sponsored by Couchbase and IBM. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides and a recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me pass the floor to our sponsor Couchbase and Jeff for a brief word. Jeff, take it away. Thanks so much, Mark, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation as well with, uh, with Donna. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Jeff Morris. I run product marketing at Couchbase. And to get started, I really just want to remind you how frequently you're interacting with a Couchbase powered application almost every single day. So whether that's uh, your booking travel uh, through Sabre or Amadeus, whether you're scrolling your LinkedIn feed, all of that is cached inside of uh, a Couchbase powered system. They're doing about 4.6 million uh, account profiles per second, uh, uh, according to one of their, uh, their blogs. But every time your, uh, your favorite Tostitos product or uh, a Frito-Lay product gets delivered to your supermarket, that's being handled by a mobile application that is running Couchbase. When you're streaming your favorite TV shows, whether it's on uh, Hulu or uh, DirecTV or Peacock or Sky, uh, those are all uh, Couchbase powered applications as well. But then we do a lot of work in financial services, the FICO Falcon platform, which is subscribed by 9,000 banks and covers two thirds of the world's credit card accounts. Uh, that's a, a Couchbase powered application as well. And if you're going on a cruise, whether it's Carnival or Royal Caribbean, uh, and they're giving you that great, great user experience that you're, uh, you're hoping for, where everything is catered to you exactly as you like, that's Couchbase there too. Uh, EA Sports uses us, other gaming systems use us. And I think the real commonality across all of this is that many of these, uh, are, most of our customers are doing things like matching, um, matching a user profile to a big product catalog stuff. And uh, as they're doing that, they're collecting and, and, and managing a ton of attributes about uh, perhaps that account, as well as about the, uh, uh, the catalog activity or the other business operations that are, that, uh, are being automated there. In many cases, it's how long is a session going, or you know, what time of day did somebody log in? Uh, you know, what, uh, what was the last time that a piece of information happened to change? All of those are, are Couchbase powered styles of, of application functionality that indeed are generating a lot of metadata. So the metadata that we tend to generate and, and end up using is to drive personalized experiences, right? Support uh, you know, additional customer facing information or uh, deliver operational analytics or help you understand uh, my, my little video here is a demonstration of a visual search uh, uh, capability inside of our Couchbase Lite mobile uh, uh, database that's actually doing a, uh, a vector or an AI powered uh, similarity search on the device. And in this case, it's identifying uh, produce and then making a shopping cart out of that. And what that really demonstrates to us is we're also able to create applications that will allow you to do things like visual search and recognize or identify an object or things and then do take an action with them. So as I mentioned, JSON is awesome because, you know, as it were, NoSQL database. And JSON's great because it allows us to, to set up systems where the metadata that you're trying to use or you want to you want to use later is actually part and parcel with the application data itself. So the metadata accompanies the data in many, many uh, situations. You can see my timestamp is an example of this, but you can store it as account profile information. You can store metadata for perhaps building prompt variables for AI or supporting other distributed processing kinds of activities. 
And you can access it by a number diff of different data access patterns uh, for that to make the, the developer who's building the application uh, enjoy very, very robust functionality. And of course, as we look ahead into what's coming next in our application worlds, um, AI is AI based applications and activities are going to create massive amounts of new metadata, whether that's the prompt information, uh, answers to uh, and, and conversations you have with LLMs, validation of what the LLM says, you know, making sure that it's not crazy, um, and then supporting agentic kinds of applications in the future. And we've got all kinds of capabilities that uh, assist with that, whether it's our coding assistant that's built into uh, our workbench, it's like a co-pilot. We added uh, a vector search functionality in the database itself. Uh, we've added columnar analytic functionality into the database, uh, but we've got chatbots and vector search in mobile, as I just mentioned, a very, very broad set of capabilities for building and supporting mobile applications. So finally, why Couchbase? Because we're really fast. We're super versatile. We do mobile when most uh, organizations have a difficult time doing so. We're gonna, we support large language models for building AI powered applications and give you great TCO. So follow up with, uh, uh, go to couchbase, uh, uh, cloud.couchbase.com for sign up to look at our free tier. It's a brand new offering that uh, as long as you use it, you can use it forever. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, Dataversity and uh, really looking forward to, like I said, to uh, Donna's uh, presentation here. Back to you, Mark. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. And now let me pass the floor to Bala for a couple minutes from IBM, our sponsor. Thank you. Bala, take it away. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for the folks who joined this webinar. Uh, Mark and the team, can you hear me okay? You sound wonderful. Excellent. Uh, all right, I'm Bala Vaidilingam. I'm the IBM Worldwide Leader for Data and AI, uh, specialized on data and AI as per my thing. I've been doing this metadata management, data governance for more than two decades around the world. So I think we often talk about metadata. I just wanted to be on the same page for the, you know, when it comes to the definition of metadata. If you give an analogy of a can of soup, what's the actual soup itself is, in, you know, data. The properties of the can is nothing but a metadata. When you talk about the, from an IT asset perspective, this could be either definition of your tables, your columns, data types, and the retention period, how long you wanted to store the data, and so forth. Right? So that's the basic fundamentals of what is metadata. You often hear the definition of data about data. Hopefully, this visual representation gives the indication of what that means. So when you talk about metadata, it's not only the technical metadata. You have this notion of four different types of metadata, the business metadata. This is basically the governance policies, uh, the governance rules, the business taxonomies, the data dictionary, classification, and so forth. All the semantic labels all falls into the business metadata. And then the technical metadata, I think most of you are more familiar, which is, as the name suggests, the technical information about the data structures. And then the third portion is an operational metadata. Often, you know, we call it as a runtime metadata. Um, and then the last one is a social metadata, where if people are collaborating the data within the enterprise, what are the different types of other information that we can gather, uh, which is like a ratings, reviews, tags, and what are the activities around those metadata, those activity logs, all comes under social metadata. So for a best, when you talk about best practices in a metadata management, it is much important not only limiting this to a technical metadata, it's all about bringing all these metadata together to have the true 360 degree view of the metadata, right, the data. So what organizations are trying to achieve, if you look into the left and right, the blue is the business metadata and the yellow is the technical metadata. So we all know blue plus yellow makes it green. All we want to do is bring the business and technical IT comes together. How we do that by bridging this business metadata, the semantic labels, on top of the technical assets, why we are trying to do that? The reason is it really helps organization to easily find and use the data with the natural language queries, immaterial of how the data is stored and where it is stored and how it is modeled. The ultimate goal is how do you make the data consumers to go seamlessly go and find and consume this data, right? So traditionally, this used to be a lot of manual process. People have to do a manual stitching and linking of this business metadata to the technical metadata. With IBM solution, Cloud Pack for Data, Knowledge Catalog, all these things are completely automated. 
leveraging the automation and AI. We do leverage the machine learning techniques, automation techniques, and the generative AI in order to bring the business metadata and the technical metadata to be bridged together. So from an IBM point of view, so we do offer the three core services, which is IBM Knowledge Catalog, primarily for the purpose of curating and managing the data assets for the enterprise, uh, including an automated discovery, automated enrichment, and automated governance. The second piece of the service is the Ma uh, Manta Data Lineage. This helps to automatically scan the applications in your enterprise, whether it's an on-prem or the cloud, and automatically scan and, and, uh, and produce an end-to-end -end data lineage to show the data flow. Often this is mandate for most of the organizations because of the regulatory compliance. And again, when you do the Manta Lineage, this is readily available in our knowledge catalog as a business lineage for business people to well understand the flow in an abstract layer. And then the third one is the data product hub. The data product hub is nothing but enabling those data assets in the form of data products for highly repeatable and reusable within the enterprise. How do we approach this in a metadata management perspective? Like I said in the past, there used to be a multi-step manual process with IBM approach. It's all about in one process, it's going to automatically discover the metadata, import the metadata, classify this metadata, identify the sensitive data, whether it's a PII, SPI, confidential, and analyze the data quality, data profiling, establish the data quality scorecards, evaluate the data against various data quality dimensions, and then automatically assign the business terms, the data dictionaries, and in fact, we also leverage large language model to automatically generate a logical name and description for every data attributes. Therefore, it's much easier for a user to consume this data through this knowledge catalog. And from this knowledge catalog, a qualified data assets and highly governed data assets could make it to data marketplace for uh, subscription to these data assets within the enterprise. Speaking of Manta lineage, like I said, we do have a connectors that connects to the data sources, data integration tools, enterprise data warehouse, appliances, the lake house, and all the consumption applications. So you have a pre-built list of scan, scanners that are available to establish the end-to-end data lineage. And wherever there is no scanner available, we also have an open Manta framework to establish the data lineage for those applications. The last, data as a product in the marketplace. I think this is a very important concept because what you see in the knowledge catalog or the data catalog is your inventory of the data assets. Not necessarily every inventory will be in the marketplace. So from that inventory, you make do a grouping of data assets that forms a data product. The reason for the data product is you have a formal data contract for consumers to agree upon and you have a different delivery channels. Think about an Amazon where I can ship the data through the home or I can download the digital products from my website. Similarly, the same up, uh, concept applicable in the data assets where certain data assets could be directly delivered through the consumer application of their choice through the in-flight service or the data could be downloaded by the application if the data owners are willing to enable such delivery channels. Awesome, Bala. Do you have a slide? There we go. Uh, yeah, I was just so going to say, do we so have some much. contact information? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for the team and thank you, Dataversity team. Uh, if you are more interested in learning more about Data Fabric, there's a QR code. Please feel free to scan it and that will help you to experiment these Data Fabric services. And there's also a QR code for my LinkedIn profile if you wanted to contact and further have this conversation. Great, thanks, thanks for your time, Bella, and thank you for that uh, for that word from IBM. And uh, now let me pass and introduce the speaker of this monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently Managing Director of Global Strategy, Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. She has co-authored several books on data management and is a regular contributor to industry publications. With that, let me give the floor to Donna. Hello and welcome, my friend. Hello, thank you. It's always a pleasure to do these and always always a pleasure to see the audience that has great feedback and is never shy in the chat and, and conversation. So looking forward to some good questions. So let me move ahead so we can hopefully have some time for, for Q&A. So um, 
this is a series. So if this is your first time joining us, either at Dataversity or for this data architecture series, um, welcome. Um, for those of you who I recognize some familiar names, thank you for always, you have some very, very faithful fans, which is really nice. Um, but if you did miss any of the earlier ones in the year, Dataversity is really great about keeping these on their website, as do we at Global Data Strategy. We have a link to those as well. Um, you can catch all the ones that you may have missed because there's been some great topics. Um, and then there's two coming up. Um, if you are interested in things like enterprise architecture or data modeling, which is always a popular one um, and the business benefits of that, which both of those relate to metadata, which is our topic for today. So let's get into that. Um, metadata, gosh, that's been around forever. And it, and it was nice to see some of the, the speakers, Jeff and Bala, also have great uh, backgrounds in that as well, because it, it's an old fashioned thing that's new again, right? It, and it is hotter than ever. I'll show you the results of some surveys. I mean, part of it is that there's so many more use cases with things like AI, as well as the good old fashioned, you know, business intelligence reporting and things, um, and things like uh, industry regulations, right? You, you need to have that lineage and traceability of data. Um, and while it is classic and tried and true, I do think there's some new strategies and approaches to develop not only metadata, but as you've seen from both of the speakers, the ever evolving data landscape, right? We have our typical relational databases, but there's so much more now. So how, how do you keep track of all of that? So hopefully, as with all of our webinars, um, we try to take complexity and, and simplify it a bit and, and maybe have some humor along the way because you one can quickly get overwhelmed with complexity, um, but I think there are some tried and true strategies to move forward and really start to get the value from metadata. Um, and it's fun to see so many organizations really leveraging metadata and, and getting the benefits from it. So let's just jump right in. So um, what's nice to see, and, and you folks might be uh, familiar with this, um, Global Data Strategy and Dataversity partner each year, I guess for the past six years or so, on a... a survey on trends in data management. And I, I find it fun to see some of the things stay the same, some kind of evolve over time. Um, metadata is always one of the top priorities. So this this question was, um, and it's multiple choice before folks add up the numbers and see that it's not exactly 100. This was what all of the above um, are is a priority. And metadata management was definitely in the top five, it was number three. And what was nice to see that it has increased by 20% year over year. So. Again, what, what one of my, I have a lot of Donna rants and I'll probably try to limit them this time, but um, you know, people mistake foundational with old fashioned, right? right? Like we think of a wheel, right? Wheels have been around for thousands of years. Teslas, you know, are, still have wheels, right? So it doesn't mean because something's been around, um, it's no longer useful, usually the contrary. Um, so metadata management is one of those. We've been doing metadata probably since data began. Um, and with the new technologies like AI and machine learning, it is even more important, right? So I, I think this shows that um, where it's always been in the top 10 and now it's even more with the new technologies that it becomes even more relevant with automation. One needs metadata. I think Bala mentioned that really well, right? <laughs> it's not, we replace automate, you know, we don't need metadata because we're automating. It's absolutely the opposite. You need it to have that 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 context um, of, for your data. So, um, another use case that I thought was interesting from us that that report is why are people using metadata. Um, maybe this is, you know, probably number one is that data governance and, and that's good. That's a bit of, you know, we have the carrot and the stick. You know, if, if I don't know what the calculations on my reports are and how they were calculated or what the definition of total sales or where this data came from and what's the audit trail, that's where data governance comes in, right? How can you understand data quality, improving data quality if you don't understand the context and meaning of data, et cetera, right? That's a bit of the 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 stick and not the carrot. But when you see things like data warehousing, BI reporting, data science, analytics, that's a bit more of, hey, I want to get value from this. I want to be more agile and efficient. Um, and metadata comes in. So it, it's really used across a lot of different use cases. Uh, data governance tends to be often a driver for metadata, but is certainly not the only use case for that. So um, if you've joined us before, you have seen this framework um, be, because it, it shows that it's it's both and all of the above, right? So when you're looking at a holistic data strategy, um, you'll see that metadata is a key component of that. And, and not to get ourselves tied in a knot, but you could say, well, it's hard to do governance without metadata. It's hard to have architecture without metadata, right? So that, that's why we use this. It just shows that there's a touch point across all of these. 
And then when we do a strategy for organizations, it's really what's the balance of how much of each one of these you do, because if you bite off everything, you're never going to get finished. So what's that right mix in our in our shopping basket of just that right mix of metadata with architecture, with master data, with governance to align with your business strategy? So um, it is core, it is foundational, um, and every every data implementation needs it. It's just the how, the what, the where, and the why, which we'll cover today. So Starting out, we love ourselves definitions. Um, and you, if if you've heard metadata, you probably hear, and I think Bala mentioned it too, data about data. Here's the Donna rant. Please don't use that. Okay, it's cute, right? <laughs> but I think metadata is already a complicated word for a very obvious thing. And then we we get even worse and complicate it further. So I almost didn't put it on the slide, but I will put it on the slide by saying, please don't use it, right? Because I think once people see it and get it, it's just obvious. We just historically have, have used this sort of funny word. Although the the new generation, that idea of something being meta is kind of a, a slang, right? So maybe it's not a weird word anymore. People kind of get the idea of, oh, metadata is kind of meta, isn't it? Um, so anyway, that, that's what that is. I like to use just metadata as data in context, because that really puts maybe a little more context around what metadata is, or even better, I like to say it's a who, what, where, why when and how of data. And I, I actually steal this from a client that basically said, you know, the strongest words in the English language are for example, right? So here's an example of some metadata and then people get it right away. Of, you know, who who is the data steward? Who's using it? Who owns it? Who's regulating it? What is probably the more common one we think of? Definitions, business rules, security, privacy level, abbreviations, et cetera. Where? Another common one with your lineage um, is a big one. Um, just good old fashioned data dictionary of like wh what's in this database and how do we, I guess that's a what, but it's sort of aware of the what. <laughs> that made a lot of sense. Uh, why? I, I really think this is a strong one and we often forget this. It's that fit for purpose around data. The data that might have been stored for one purpose or created for one purpose may not be applicable for another purpose. So really understanding the context of why this was collected in the intended usage before we use it for a different purpose. When? It's a huge one, right? This is a great, you know, we're looking at some open data set. Is it from 1901 or is it from last year, right? That's a huge and it's an extreme example, but um, you know, what what is this relevant? Is this uh, historical? Um, and then how that's often what we think of with metadata, you know, the, how is it formatted? You know, how is it stored? Kind of that technical metadata there. So there's obviously more, um, but this is kind of a helpful checklist. And am I kind of at least having a piece of all of these? Cause this really does, give you that full context around data, which is metadata. So um, an example is always helpful. If this is your you know, good old standard spreadsheet or database, um, your your data is, you know, John Smith works for Computer R, R Us in uh, New York and he purchased something in 1970, I, I, I think, um, if we can just imply that. So the metadata is kind of your column headings, the fact that Joe is Joe's first name and Smith is his last name and company. Well, you could say that's obvious. Is it the company he works for the company he bought something for, right? That's where your you know, city is that the city of the store? Is that where he lives? Is that where his credit card gets the bill? Is that where he was born? You know, <laughs> could be a lot of content not to go crazy with this, or we can start to sound um, really annoying to people, but within context, you really need to under stand that. So the metadata, think of it simply as your headings, the context, and the data is the actual values. Or um, moving forward, you know, is, is this metadata? I would say yes, right? That if the name of the column is string one or string two or text one, that's metadata, that's technical metadata. But I think as we create data assets, is that helpful metadata? And I'm sure you're all, maybe you're cringing of seeing um, databases like this, you reverse engineer, you know, we'll talk more about that. And, and both of the speakers mentioned that so much of this can be automated nowadays. So you can reverse engineer and, and scan in a data structure, create a automated data dictionary and get something like this. And that's nice, I suppose, at least, you know, the, the context of the table, but that doesn't give you business context. Yes, it's a string field. Um, but understanding first name, last name is even last name. Well, we can get into that, right? So each one of these has, has context, right? Um, so, um, you know, a little bit more about that. And I already kind of mentioned that even as something, and this is where we often sound crazy as metadata people until it's the example people resonate with. Like, what do we mean by a year? You know, that can seem really philosophical until, um, is that the year it was purchased? Is that the year, you know, or the city? Is that the city where the customer lives? Is that the city where the, the store is located? Is that 
last name? Is that surname? Is that family name? Is that just, you know, because not every company country has the same order of of names as, as maybe North America does, right? So there's a lot of different context around something as simple as year, city, name, <laughs> company, right? Every one of these has context. And unless that is documented correctly, um, that's where a lot of the embarrassing stories that we hear with data quality and data issues and privacy breaches and all of that. And I'll give some examples. I could probably do a whole day's worth of webinar <laughs> of all the different examples of where really horrible business um, embarrassments or fines or whatever came from just a, a metadata description. So um, super important. So um, I don't get it as much. Maybe I'm in a smaller circles, but you often get this idea of what do we really need metadata? You know, I often get it, full disclosure, from the technical team. So we don't have time for that. Gosh, everyone knows what a date is, seriously. Um, I think often the business gets it more than the tech folks. And this was a survey a little bit... Um, dated now, but when we said who was the users of metadata, 80% was a lot of the business users, right? They they sort of under, or they, or us, or we, whoever you are on the call. Um, it, you know, something as simple as how did you calculate total sales, right? That's pretty darn important. And if we don't have that documented, it just seems crazy to a business person. I remember once we were back in the day when things were called metadata repositories, I think they're data catalogs now, but we were trying to kind of sell that concept to finance. And we were saying, you know, we can show how the how these financial figures were calculated and where the data came from and the lineage. And, and she looked at us in sort of horror and we were thinking, oh, she doesn't get it. And no, it was the contrary. She said, I mean, you don't do this already? That's really frightening. Like we could not get away with that in finance. Imagine asking finance, how much money do we have? Oh, I don't. I. I don't know. Like, do you think we have time to track that? You know, we're busy making money. We don't have time to like put together profit and loss statements. That's so old fashioned, right? They they couldn't last a day in finance with that attitude. So I think they were shocked um, that we in the data didn't have that same level of of you know rigor. Um, and I think she's right. <laughs> we we should have that. And the good news is, you know, the bad news to defend ourselves, it's complicated. You know, there's a lot of different sources. The good news, some of this can be automated, and then you can use people's brains for the right pieces of this to define. A person should define how total sales, and through governance, we should agree, right? Not everything should and can't be automated. Um, so uh, moving ahead, um, you know, and I, and I think this is that kind of, um, oops, sorry, partnership between um, you know this idea of the business and a, a good data architect or metadata architect of that business meaning and context. So, and, and I can see it where the business maybe thinks we're crazy. You know, could you show me all customers by region and, and can I have that by this afternoon? How hard can that possibly be, right? And maybe you're lucky enough that in your organization that's just in a nice clean data warehouse and it's all organized and, and there's a data catalog showing all the lineage and definitions and all that. But if you're like many organizations, it, it isn't all that clean and easy, right? So a data architect is thinking of all that complexity. What do you what do you mean by customer, right? That plat classic, you know, is it car? And, and again, until I remember my first data diversity conference way back in the day, someone mentioned that and everybody laughed and I was 20 and I realized I, how hard that be? Why is everyone laughing? How hard is it to define a customer, right? But again, that for example, well, is it current customers? Is it lapsed customers? Is it high net worth customers? Is it, you know, family of customers? Is it householding? Is it, there's a lot of complexity around customers. Not that we don't know what the word customer means, right? It's, it's do we put it in context, which is the metadata, right? How do you define region? Again, we can sound crazy until you bring examples. I would say, you know, having done dozens of data warehouses in the past year or so, um, Region is always a complex. Is it? Is it? Is it? Um, you know, geographical region. Is it sales regions? Is it? You know, and again, we don't have to tie ourselves in a knot and never ever go forward. Sometimes it's as easy as a qualifier. Yes, we say ge geographic region and we say sales region. Let's just name it and be done, right? I think sometimes maybe because we have a little fun with it, we architects can go a little far and never make a decision. <laughs> um, but I think generally, it's either a different thing. Um, right, or, or, and you, you have a qualifier or it's the same thing and agree on a common definition. I know that's easier said than done with when people you know have arguments about this, but it doesn't have to be rocket science, right? Or something as similar as can a customer have more than one billing address? Can they, you know, in different regions, do we obfuscate PII, right? There is so much complexity and context around something as simple as show me all customers by region, is customer a company, is it a human being, right? Don't, stopped on and we get the point, right? So you can see that there's, a, you know, a lot of context that you need to think of and that context is the metadata that we're talking about. Um, 
And again, I can see people saying this until you, you're you're the victim of bad metadata. Uh, gosh, I just know. Seriously, I have this huge deadline and you make me document something like, what is a part number? You know, it's the number of a part, right? Please don't have definitions like that. But um, generally, there's a story about things that are very, very simple. It could be, you know, someone that's been with a company for 20 years. Oh, part number that used to be a component number before the acquisition. And those should be the same. Oh. I didn't know that until, right? So if you are the person with all the knowledge in your head, please document it for others. Um, if you're the person um, running a data catalog or a, a data governance, please find these folks and make them data stewards and, and get that great value um, in a collaborative way and store it in. And we'll talk about that coming up. A lot of different ways to store it, a, a business glossary, a data catalog, data models, other collaboration tools. Ideally, it's the same definition shared across all. We could talk about that as well. Um, but I would say when in doubt, at least be careful saying this, at least even just put it in a spreadsheet. Not, not you know, please don't announce to the world Donna Burbank said we should do our data catalog in a spreadsheet. Um, no, not at the end, you know, as, as your final enterprise solution, but at least it is documented, right? And you can, or, or it already exists in some spreadsheets that you can kind of capture from. So please avoid the, gosh, how hard is that? I just know. At least ask the question, um, because I betcha any noun, any adjective in the, in the company has context around it, because um, companies are complex. There's a lot of history there. So, Again, to beat this one to death, you know, a, a metadata cartoon, they do exist, right? And then maybe this just isn't funny, or maybe it's not funny until you've run into it, right? But we're almost done with acceptance testing. Everything looks great. We're about to go live. What do we mean by a, a customer again, right? And and that might seem really weird. I worked, and it will remain nameless, but a very large software company that um, did exactly metadata management in the day. And they had a very embarrassing thing where they were trying to send out renewal notices for the software. And someone just said, we'll go to the customer databases. And what does sales do all the time? They say, I'm going to go visit a customer, right? That's fine. That's human language. And we could get nerdy. No, you're visiting a prospect. They're not a customer yet. They don't own the software, right? So, you know, are you going to, you know, word police a salesperson going to see the customer? No, but you should somewhere say that these aren't customers, they're prospects, right? But they didn't. So someone saw the word customer, sent out all these renewal notices, time to renew. And these folks didn't even own the software, right? So they end up losing sales. Like, gee, that's a little uh, pushy. We haven't even bought and you're asking us to renew. Back to the symbol definition of what do we mean by a customer? It's a word, but that, there was a lot of context. And the irony was this was a metadata management company. So anyway, the cobbler's children often have no shoes. Um, I do think if we had better metadata in life, um, there would be world peace, right? How many things have happened um, just by people maybe had a different definition of a word or, you know, do we have the metadata to find before we're building something like a warehouse or a data lake house or something, right? Do we do this in our daily life? Think of, I don't know how many folks from the call are from the U.S. or maybe had their parents do this and that during the summer, we're going to drive across the U.S. and see every, you know, thing and how many divorces, family hatred has kind of come from that, right? But maybe it could have been solved by what, what do people see when they say the word vacation, right? And you can just see, you're probably cringing from this, right? Father, he goes, oh, vacation. I think I want to stop at every state park and, and learn something new from the interactive exhibit. That that would really feel like not only did I see things, but I've learned something too. Mom rolls her eyes and she goes, oh, I've been working really hard. I don't need to learn anything new. I'm going to read a, a novel and relax. So I'll sit in the car while you go learn something. Jane is frustrated at the whole thing. And she says, I've been studying enough. I, I want to go actually go hike in the state park. This is ridiculous, Dad. Bye. You know, Bobby didn't even want to come. He's like, a vacation to me is not sitting in the car with my family. I, I'm 16. I wanted to hang out with my friends. Cousin Ian from the UK, he's like, I don't even know what you talk about a vacation. We'd call that a holiday. And if there's no pub, don't. <laughs> don't sorry to insult anywhere, but there's no pub. I don't want to be there. And Donna, I'm fine. Just give me a laptop and I can do some metadata architectures. It's fine with me. That's a vacation, right? Think of the conflict over just something is what do you mean by a vacation, right? And maybe that's a facetious example, but think of everything. What do we mean by a customer? What do we mean by a product? What do we mean by fiscally? All these different things, defining it and moving ahead can actually think of the conflicts on projects or thinking of the conflicts of, of understanding a report, right? So another example, uh, you may have heard of this one is the classic one, uh, NASA. Um, they 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 lost a, a, a Mars orbiter spacecraft uh, due to a metadata issue. Right. They they were, you know, calculating this is rocket science. So it was kind of hard. Um, but when it came down to the issue, 
um and and when they were doing the the data it was sent in english pound seconds instead of metric so it didn't end up in the right spot right so it actually sent the, the craft off course it got lost not only is that super embarrassing not only is that cost actually a whole lot of money think of the brand and reputational da damage i think a lot of folks in metadata have heard this story doesn't make nasa look great and at the end of the day, they lost some opportunities to actually do research because they didn't have that, right? So think of anything in your company. It's not just the embarrassment. It's not just the money. There's a lot of different aspects over something as simple as metadata. But before I pick on NASA too, too much, because um, they're a great organization, they actually now, that was years ago, they actually have very decent open data, uh, right? That's published with some really good metadata. Maybe they, they, miss, they, they learned their lesson. I have actually a little bit of a plug uh, on on data diversity. I have a metadata course, and we go into a lot of definition on that of, of all the different sources of data um, and metadata about it. And, and because we talk a lot about relational databases, that's fine. A lot of data is there, but the even you know videos have metadata and open data sets have metadata. Right? Open data is actually, I think, um, a great use case. You can download things off the web. Who created it? What are the data types? Why? What was its source? What? Who? Why was it? You know, collected, et cetera, et cetera. And I've noticed because I'm I'm kind of a data geek. Full disclosure. Um, when you do look at open data, generally there's a whole metadata section. You cannot publish it without metadata because just common sense, right? That would be crazy. Why? Why would you just publish numbers with no context about what these numbers are? So I want to give. NASA, a little bit of credit, they actually have some really good metadata out there now, um, but not everybody. So this um, is an example I kind of ran into. Um, ironically, I, I was trying to do a webinar on, on data visualization, and I, I kind of wanted to show that the power of a lot of these data visualization tools, and I wanted to show the power of there's so much data out online with open data, and look at all the great things you can do. And I started there. And I thought it would be funny to kind of have this example of let's do road safety by vehicle make and model, like are the Porsche drivers getting in more accidents or whatever, right? But I downloaded with all great intentions, and this is literally what I got. I see that F-13 is huge. I see that 2015 VS something is big, right? And, and there's a whole bunch of 2015, which is probably a date, right? Absolutely unusable data. Probably because someone said, oh, I don't have time to put metadata out there. Let's just publish the data. People will get it. Okay, to be fair, maybe I could figure out this was a date and not 2015 somethings, but I have no idea which road vehicle is the biggest safety, right? So a great example of without data, metadata, data is really useful. It's just garbage numbers, right? So it still happens. It's still out there. I think we would have learned our lessons, but not yet. Um, and there's more examples, you know, something as simple as what is a year? Again, we can sound crazy, but this is a classic one. Are we talking fiscal year? Are we talking um, calendar year? There's more and more. I won't go into all of them, but this was one of a client we actually had. Um, they were trying to that classic show me sales by quarter, by region, by product, right? And they were trying to do some research off this. And, and usually the fourth quarter, um, at least in, in North America, like, the, or, in, you know, there's, there's some holidays and then people buy a lot of presents for the holidays. And that seems to be typically for this retail company was a huge spike, but they looked into Latin America and that was not the case. So they were, you know, should we do more marketing? Is this the wrong market? They just don't like our product. Should we close some stores? Like seriously, those were the conversations until somebody brought up, oh, they use a different fiscal year. So their fourth quarter isn't December, it's something else, right? So again, these folks were just about to like close stores and change product because of a metadata issue, right? So again, we sound really nerdy, um, but it's so important um, to get to these core definitions before we start making decisions on the data. Um, one of the nice things metadata can do, and a lot of this can and should be automated, um, is automation of data lineage, right? So if I had, and this is where the, the lady in finance kind of looked in horror when in this, you don't have this. It's easier and easier to do this. There's still tricky parts to it, but can I look at how that data was mapped from the different databases to the staging, to the warehouse, et cetera, and, and, and see that traceability. And, and in this case, they, this company was actually able to do that. Ironically, they had really good technical metadata um, when it came down to the business metadata. There was some, just some core misunderstandings, but they were able to solve that one. So they didn't make any big mistakes yet. So who uses metadata, right? So everybody, <laughs> once it's the, one of those things, everyone likes to use it. People don't like to create it, right? Shouldn't take that long though. Just, just 
document your work, right? Um, it could be the business person. What do we mean? What is the definition, the calculation of regional sales? I won't keep doing it. What is a region? How do we calculate sales, right? All of that. Um, the data architect, what is the data structure? What is the approved data structure? So we're all storing it in the same way on the technical side. Um, the auditor might actually want to know, show me the lineage of how this total sales was calculated so I can trust your reports. The, the data warehouse architect might get really into that details of the source to target mappings. Um, this one I like, and I could, I, I'll stop with all my storytelling, but I have seen retail websites go down because somebody changed the product number field. I mean, if I change this field, what else is going to be affected? So rather than reactive, proactive, right? So before I change something, what is the impact analysis of this change, either business or technical, um, which is really powerful with some of these data catalogs. Um, and this is one we don't think of enough too. How many people have gone into a new company? I know I feel this because I'm a consultant and you go into a new company with new acronyms all the time. And you don't want to sound dumb, but you know, is this a company acronym or is there, is there something in the industry that I'm missing? Um, a nice good old data glossary, right? Of the business terms of acronyms. What What is our company's terminology um, is a really great way to get some buy-in for metadata. Um, so everybody at their different use cases is going to use either technical or business metadata or both, right? So we, we talked about data governance being an enabler, but also a driver for metadata management. Um, I won't read through uh, all of these, but you'll see everyone from the business data owner, what are the definitions of core, core metrics? What are our policies? What is the, what, what's private information? As you get into the d data steward, they're going to go a little bit more into those detailed rules. Um, Acronym definitions, the architect should be looking at data structures, both conceptual and logical and physical, I guess, uh, and naming standards, data lineage, um, system data stewards, folks looking at your different applications, what is the structures, what do fields mean, aligning those, um, and then, of course, your data engineer or big DBA, you know, your physical structures, naming standards, data type standards. I mean, it's it's, it's a lot. And I think, I think Bala showed a good example of that too. There's a lot of different types of both business and technical metadata across the organization. So how do we do this? This is a best practice. I, I've seen things evolve. I've been doing metadata across for almost for 30 years now. Um, and I think in the old days, it was a lot of encyclopedia only. So, and this is kind of a Donnaism. There's encyclopedia and there's Wikipedia, right? And, and what's the difference? So in encyclopedia, think of, you know, there's some academic up in the ivory tower with, you know, defining this is the truth. We publish encyclopedias once a year and it has been vetted. It's fairly static. You don't go change the encyclopedia every day, right? Wikipedia, in fact, I was skeptical in the beginning, right? Of we just have it out there. And eventually if I say that, a, I don't know, an, an elephant is a furry you know, creature with big ears, someone's going to catch that and say they don't have fur, whatever, right? Um, and, and you're going to be edited by many that eventual consistency with enough people looking at it, and it's more dynamic. Um, and both have their place. I use Wikipedia all the time. It's actually much better than I would have thought, right? Is it always perfect? No, but neither is an encyclopedia, right? So I would say, as it relates to data and metadata catalogs, um, there is a place for both, but choose wisely, right? So if I'm thinking of my corporate um, master data or my reference data, or I'm going to publish my financial figures to the street or to auditors, it should be that encyclopedia approach, right? We should have it vetted through governance. You should be able to get feedback of, oh, wait a minute, this might be the wrong definition. Can we talk? But people don't get just, just to go edit it. But think of on the right with the Wikipedia, we're doing some data discovery. We're trying to understand a new data set and we're doing, you know, citizen development and self-service and we're, we're, Hey, uh, what about, let's add this data set in. What do you think? And we learn this from the social media analysis and you want it to be edited by many or I, Hey, let's try this new data source. And you don't want to lock everything down. Right. And I've seen too many companies, um, you know, the true answer is it's a balance. Generally, you want a little bit of both, depending on the data set and the use case. I have seen, and tools tend to, I'm not going to talk about specific tools, but they tend to be, a, some are better at the one on the right, and some are better on the one on the left. Um, but we work with a big international bank, 
and they had one that was much more collaboration based. And I actually had an argument with the CEO of the, the vendor company. So everyone should be able to change data. You know, this is a democracy. I'm like, well, not if this is the financial figures for an international bank that you, no one just gets an opinion. <laughs> These are fairly vetted, right? But at the other sense, you don't want things that are so locked down that people don't have a voice and it feels like it takes forever, right? So again, you want that balance. And, and really the balance is what, what are the use cases, what type of data and who are the different stewards? but you probably want a little bit of both in, in your environment. So metadata, and I kind of talked to this, this, this one slide could be a whole webinar of, we tend to talk a lot about kind of that relational database data because it's, I'll show a slide because that's where a lot of our data that is used for reporting and things resides, right? But it's across, I don't know, social media, it's across uh, videos and files and documents, and it's both in, you know, in motion and at rest and, and across legacy systems like COBOL, right? You, you, a lot of, you know, big financial institutions are still using mainframe. Can we reverse engineer that and understand the structures without having to learn all of that, right? Um, I mentioned the open data. In fact, this was funny. I was actually, uh, at a party with some friends and, and one of my friends was a photographer and she started talking about metadata and I, I freaked her out because I'm like, what, what did you just say? She, like, what? And I, I said, you use the word metadata. Why did you use that? I was being very nerdy. She's like, because that's what they call it. You know, the stuff about when you took the picture and what setting it was. And, like, and then I left her alone. But that was an exactly a very valid use of metadata. When was that picture taken? What were the settings for the photo? All of that. And you can apply a lot of that metadata. Um the course uh, that is the data diversity course in metadata, we do kind of go into examples of all of these. And um, I find it kind of interesting the different way metadata is exposed across any sort of uh, data in the organization or, or beyond. Um, I kind of promised some data on the, I guess this is metadata about data platforms, but we we each year in the survey um, do a survey of, of what data sources are people using? Because I think what you saw from, from both of the speakers, Jeff in particular, from Couchbase was, you know, things evolve. We have no SQL. We have so many different, you know, real-time sources. However, when you look at what the company, you know, people are relying on, particularly for things like governed reporting and things, if you look on the left, what people are using today, that relational on-premise database is still number one. Spreadsheets keep me up at night. I don't love that people are honest there, right? Um, and package applications, you know, you, you do see some, you know, non-relational key value pairs and document stores and videos and, and things like that. Um, but still relational databases, especially when we're thinking of things that need to be governed, like reporting it wins the day. When you look at the future, I think relational is moving more to cloud. Um, I, I do see that in my practice a lot. Um, and you'll see that people are looking at those non-relational sources a bit more than they are now. Um, but relational databases aren't going anywhere. Um, but I think, again, like a lot of things, it's now an and condition. How do we, I would say, people are still stuck with how to manage the data and metadata from relational databases effectively. So let's not bite off more than we can chew. But are we also looking at these other sources, videos, and you know, non-relational structures? And be, because, as both of the you know introductory speakers mentioned, with AI and and with the impact of this, it's it's more important than ever, right? So we we can't skip the metadata. Um, in terms of how we manage it, there's a lot of different options. And again, this could be a whole webinar. I, I think a lot of folks think of the one on the left, um, that big centralized either metadata catalog, metadata repository, and they are awesome. Um, I used to build these in, in a different life and that was what I did for a living and, and I love them. I think in the old days we had to build more by scratch. I think nowadays there's so many automated, what they do well, think of it almost like a, a, a data warehouse for your metadata, right? There's a meta model, there's ways that they store and link data from all of these different sources together. They often have these um, automated scanners, right? So I could, or interfaces or populators, they all have a different word um, that I can just point it to a database or a data store. Or and, and a lot of that can be automated. If you have your ETL documented or ELT, then you can automate a lot of that. Generally, they have good reporting and um, portals and, and all of that. So it really does automate and store and make user friendly. Um, the other piece that I mentioned before, generally there's kind of collaboration interfaces where you can, you know, comment on and change and edit. So if you can afford one and you're at that level of maturity, absolutely, they're great. I would say don't rush into one. 
Um, the other thing to think of is that piece in the middle, that idea of a tool specific catalog, because part of the problem now, because metadata is so important, is both a positive and negative. Everybody's doing metadata. So your ETL tool and your data modeling tool and your BI tool, or you have a data dictionary or a glossary, right? And and really your your big data catalog might be a catalog of catalogs, right? <laughs> to, um, and so how do I take all of the metadata from these different applications and store it in one place so we can integrate it? However, I, I wouldn't not do anything. And in, in fact, it may be wise to not start as the first thing you do with the big catalog. I have seen a lot of success with a business glossary on SharePoint, right? Because a lot of the work of a glossary is sometimes just agreeing of what we mean by customer or region or sell, right? So start with that, really understand your use case. I also have a background with data modeling tools. Sometimes I've seen they can be a great data dictionary, right? They can also scan and publish and have a visual representation of databases, right? So think of your BI tools, right? I've done really cool things with the BI tool and you right click on the on the report and it shows the metadata from a SharePoint list, right? You can do fit for purpose solutions and that might be a great way to start. So it's the balance like everything. You may start with a tool specific catalog or a specific use case and then migrate up to the metadata catalog or combine them, et cetera. But that is both the benefit and the risk. You don't want it to proliferate, but you don't always have to buy the big tool. Um, and I would just say, because things can be automated, there's a kind of a temptation to just load everything in and figure out how to use it later. I'd be a little careful with that, right? You want to scale that out. The other thing on the right that I, I find really fascinating is, um, and Jeff mentioned kind of the JSON and the XML and, and, and sharing across orgs. What I find interesting is that we in our data diversity DEMA world um, get into our own little metadata world. We we have our definitions. And then sometimes I'll go into companies and they almost get metadata more than we do, right? That they'll say, oh, well, we're, we're sharing product information across our partners or research information of universities. And gosh, we needed to store the information in the same way. So we built this thing and I look at it and it's a data model or it's a JSON, pet, right? That because they need it, they've built it. In, in the, and often they have heard nothing about our world, like DEMA or data diversity. They've just built it because it was needed and they might've even used a different term for it or registry or something, right? But I do think that's where I'm seeing a lot of buy-in. Organizations are getting industry standard metadata because they want to share. Or Amazon, right, has great metadata standards. You can't publish your product on Amazon unless you match their product metadata standards, right? They did it because it's efficient, because it makes sense, right? And they're a big behemoth. So um, moving on, I, I, I am aware of the clock and I want to open it up for... Q and A, uh, but just some examples. Um, you know, the this is a classic, and I actually had one customer saying, "Do, do people actually do this?" And I said, "Yes, yes, you have to do it, right." So I I have the report on the right saying total sales by region. How do I see? And all these little icons are probably where metadata is. It's in your data model. It's in your warehouse. It's in the ETL. It's in your BI tool. It's in your glossary. Right. The beauty of a lot of excuse me, these solutions is a lot of this can be automated. Impact analysis, I mentioned, um, being proactive. I'm going to change the name of the brand field in our product. What's going to break? I won't tell all my stories. I've told enough. Um, but I've seen this happen in the real world too often that people change things and don't understand the impact of that change. These metadata catalogs or data catalogs can be really helpful with that. I won't get too nerdy here, but also that semantic mapping of it's called client uh, or customer in our semantic model or a business model, but maybe in an Oracle, it's called cust and in you know, DB2, it's C table underscore 16, right? Of doing that mapping for when I define what do I mean by a customer, there's a kind of a conceptual, logical, physical layer that way. Sometimes the data modeling tools do this really well. Data catalogs can also do it. Also of where is, where is customer stored across all of these different sources, right? Graph, what I love about graph is that it is metadata, the metadata is the data, right? So you're, you're really understanding the interrelationships between ob objects. I see this a lot for fraud detection, uh, network patterns, um, you know, marketing connections, who who is connected to whom and that kind of thing. Um, and, and I think both speakers mentioned this idea of automation, definitely scanning in, in data sources and things. I would be careful of that. You don't want to over automate it. I'll disagree. I think it was Bala that mentioned you can create business definitions. That one makes me nervous because I got the number of silly things I've gotten from AI that tried to uh, imply things. I would say automate where it makes sense. Like, uh, and I have done it and I have gray hairs over it, you know, 
can we make a pattern for social security numbers in the US or like there are plenty of things that machine learning can take out the automation for and then save the human brain for the stuff that should be discussed. So I'm a huge fan. Machine learning can automate a lot of the stuff that we have to use by hand, but don't automate everything. I think that's common sense. Um, but use it for the the things that were there can be pattern detection but you someone should be defining what we mean by a year and what we mean by a customer and stuff like that but if they don't have to do this stuff we have more time to do it right um i'm wrapping up here if uh, sorry if folks are worried about question time um just like anything think of metadata as a layer of data right i won't say data about data i, I told myself i couldn't right but it's just like you do a data strategy you should be thinking of a metadata strategy right so why are we doing it. And I would say when I see metadata, more so than data strategies, people do that bing bang, big bang approach because it's easy with these tools. We're just going to scan everything in and, and figure out what to do with it later. Just like your warehouse, that's going to be difficult. So I would pick some really salient use cases, get people to understand it, the business definitions, the so what um, of the key reports, the key you know data artifacts, get the buy-in go from there, rinse and repeat, right? Think about all of the different storage, uh, both how you want to capture the information. Is it from your relational databases? Is it from video file? What, what are your use cases? Start there. Then how am I going to integrate and publish? Am I going to think of this? Sorry to make you dizzy, but um, this picture here, like where are all the metadata sources now? Are we going to integrate? Are we going to store centralized? Again, a lot of the questions you're going to have with your data are the similar thing with the metadata. Is it integration? Is it storage? Is it all the above? Who are the different audiences? I've also seen a mistake of people. I know we say when we look at the report, business wants to see that full lineage. That's really hard to digest, right? So could it be simplified or do the business mostly want to see the definitions and the technical people want to see all the detailed lineage? So, so think of that because you can freak people out really quickly. And then how do we govern it over time? I showed you all the, the users of metadata, but also the, the stewards and the curators of data through governance. Think of that really carefully because whoever creates this definition really should have that ownership um, and accountability for it. So think if you were convinced of metadata, hopefully we've we've convinced you of that. There's a lot of different ways to store it. I would just say start small and make that part of your wider data strategy um, to be really clear. Um, if you want to join us next month, it's on enterprise architecture, which will be interesting. And we at Global Data Strategy do this for a living. So if you need help with metadata or anything else, give us a call. And I will now open it up to some Q&A. So over to you. Yeah, we've we've kicked off a, a contra controversy <laughs> in, in chat. <laughs> so there's a lot of chat about Gen AI and and using that to to generate definitions and such. Uh, we do have one uh, question. We just a couple of minutes for questions here, but uh, one that I definitely wanted to ask. In the financial industry, there's a lot of caution about sharing data and privacy. Any advice from the panel? Uh, even sharing metadata can divulge organizational private information. Yes. I mean, I, I, my first, um, Right. I am not, I'm not sure if I followed the, the question, but yes, metadata can be private. I mean, I initially worked for, uh, you know, the, the government, um, and there was a lot of privacy around metadata, but yeah, what fields you might be storing around an org. Um, I would think, yes, there there's metadata to track privacy, like what personal data is PII, right? But even showing that we stored somebody's social insurance number is private in and of itself in many cases, or that we're tracking certain things. So yeah, I would be careful. I wouldn't just, uh, when you publish open data, you publish the metadata about it, but just like you decide what data to publish, you probably also want to decide what metadata to publish. So I, yeah, I would agree with that, but I'd be curious what Jeff and Bala thought, Jeff. Actually, Jeff had to to drop. Oh, so right. Bala, you get to you get the the the, the sole sponsorship uh, <laughs> response here. <laughs> yeah, actually, I responded in the Q and A chat as well for the same question. You know, I, we strongly believe that's a great question to begin with because even metadata itself has a value, right? Generally, in fact, sometimes if you just present the data extract in a CSV, people don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. But once you add a metadata on top of that, that's going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Um, so yes, it's very important to secure both data and metadata, and there are different mechanisms to do that. There's a different layer of access control. It doesn't need to be all or nothing. And sometimes organizations wants to see only the basic metadata about that information data set. And 
you know, they can do a fine grain level access control. Who can see what level of data and the metadata? Yeah. Because for example, if you're calculating a financial example, if you're calculating a revenue recognition as a definition, that definition should not be visible to everybody, right? Some of them are public information. Some of them are organization internals, how they calculate the high value customer as an example. And that could be an internal to many organizations. Therefore, some of the business metadata also has to be well protected and governed so that it's not, you're not exposing this to a larger audience, even within the same organization. Yeah, absolutely. So agree. If we're very quick, we can do my favorite question that got a lot of upvotes here. So uh, uh, it's about creating that uh, engagement across the organization and champions. Uh, any suggestions on creating that culture of championship across an organization? I, I would say pick your your use case wisely, and then it will absolutely happen. And I think I, I kind of touched on it when, when people load too much in at once because it's easy to automate. I'll tell maybe one story. I, I work for a big financial institution and I wanted to do exactly that. I was the tech whiz kid with metadata. I wanted to do all the skinning in and lineage and all that. And they did eventually, to be fair. My boss said, stop. We're just going to do a business glossary of all the financial terms, what a default credit swap is and things. And so all the traders, and I was so mad. I remember stomping down Wall Street being so angry that he stopped me from doing the cool stuff. But he was absolutely right. If he's on the call, like he can tell me I told you so. But what he did is it got the buy-in because even the traders didn't understand all this. So they they started to go to this glossary or repository because that and then they became the champions and then we got the funding to do everything else so you well, all those stories i told what is a customer what is a day you will know in your organization the ones that are the pain points start with that show the value and then it will start to cascade and people will get it but the risk if you put too much and it just seems overwhelming they're, they're going to get lost and they won't once you get that right example so i i leave that to the person who asked to, to know that um but pick that first use case really wisely so that people really understand, you know, the value of this, because they will. Uh, but Pali, what do you think? Yeah, just a couple of quick three bullet points answer to this. Uh, you, you you nailed on what I highly recommend is number one, it's a cultural shift. Like you said, it has to come from some business sponsor for that initial use case to embrace people to be more collaborative, more contributing with a community approach. The second thing is you need to address the data literacy problem importance through ongoing learning. It's very important to in a, you know embrace and do the continuous learning in the organization, especially for the team who's working, who wanted to be a data champion. Third one is, it is very important to reward the teams who is managing the you know good data, metadata management. You know, often people always complain the data is not good, I don't have the good metadata, but if the once the first use case has been successful, it's very important to celebrate that success. It rewards the team. You know, I think sometimes the positive uh, energy is spread much faster. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And it influences awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. That's all we have time for. We're actually a little bit over time. So my apologies to the audience. Um, but that's all we have time for for today. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Paula, for that wonderful presentation. And Jeff, and thank you very much, Donna. Have a wonderful rest of your, your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Data